is a king seated among us. Let every home receive him now. Whether it's praise, he will inhabit, and there will be grace and mercy.
may be seated. We do come to bring our hallelujah to the Lord this morning, and we're really glad that you're here with us in person, and if you're here with us on Facebook or on YouTube, we're really thankful that you've come to worship the Lord with us and to grow in our love for God and our service to Him as we serve one another. There are a few things I want to let you know about as we begin our service. Uh, first, uh, you may have heard already, but it's my privilege to let you know that Francisca and Logan have had their baby. So he was born on Wednesday, the 11th, uh, coming in at uh, 3 uh, kilos, 3.8 kilos, and 52 centimeters long. So that gives you the statistics. Uh, you may wonder his name. Uh, his name is Quinn Salvador. Salvador means salvation. And uh, Quinn is, I think, an Irish, I think, name uh, they were saying. So very near and dear to their heart. And so we welcome little Quinn into the community of All Nations Church. We're really glad that he's here. And uh, we would encourage you, as you get a chance, to email Logan and Francisca and just let them know of your warm well wishes as he's come in. Also, you may remember, hopefully, that if you've taken a box for Living Hope Ukraine, that today is the day to get those boxes in. Hopefully, you brought those. If you're going, <gasps> I didn't bring my box. Um, there is an opportunity to get those boxes to us uh, on this sheet that had the information on what to buy is also some email addresses. You can email the addresses on there, or if you're here, you can talk to Hubert uh, or Sylvie in the back, and they will help you know how to get that box or what way you can get the boxes to them. Uh, in spite of the pandemic, we've had a, a great response, and now the key challenge is getting all those boxes in so we can get those off. So please, um, if, you, if you haven't gotten those in, you have a box, uh, let's get that done and let, get it moving out, and we'll let you know how that, what the total count on that was. Two other things to remind you of. Uh, the first is just a reminder to, if you haven't done it already, to think about joining a affinity group. Uh, find some people that are interested in the same thing that you are, uh, and there are going to be some different ways to connect with them, whether that be in Zoom or in person on, in small groups. But in this time when we are separated from each other in so many ways, it's really important to find safe ways to connect with other people. And oftentimes through our hobby, through the things that we love, that God's given us the privilege of enjoying is a great way to do that. So I'd really encourage you to go to the website, or if you receive the weekly up, uh, email update on there, there's a link you can go and you can sign up uh, and indicate uh, which one of those groups, or if there's a different group you'd like to be a part of. 
Uh, finally, I just want to encourage you again uh, to uh, engage in the for today process of uh, learning and growing deeper in our relationship with God. The for today is four things that we are inviting you, encouraging you, exhorting you to do each day. Uh, whether you're following with us or you're doing something different on your own, and those four things are to give thanks to God. Uh, to read a passage of Scripture, and we have, I think, behind me the passage uh, for this week of Scripture that we would encourage you to that goes along with the theme uh, of this week's message that helps it hopefully to go deeper in your life. To pray for someone. Someone came up to me today and asked me to pray, and that's one of the things that I will be praying for then today. And then to act in some way to bless or to show kindness to someone. And it's amazing, those four things, they transform our life. They change us in the way that we interact, in the way that we live, in the way that we engage with other people. It changes our heart when we're thankful. It's interesting, when you start being thankful, it's interesting all the other things that come. And when you start to pray, all the other people that you start to pray for. It's a directional change in our heart. And especially in the midst of this time, we need that. And this is an opportunity in the midst of the challenge to grow deeper in our relationship with God. So we hope that you'll take advantage of that. There's some information on Facebook and on Instagram, also on our weekly update. And if you're not getting the weekly update, it's a good reminder to, to go ahead and sign up for that. So with those announcements, I'd invite you to stand as we uh, come together in our call to worship this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and do not forget his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquity and who heals your diseases, who redeems you from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed by the eagles.
become thy embrace to love you from the inside
King above all kings, Jesus Christ, the King above all Let us pray together. Almighty God and loving Father, gracious Lord and sovereign King, we come before you on this beautiful morning to adore you, to adore you as our Lord and Savior, to adore you as the one who through his grace has made us free. And Lord, as we adore you with the church on, on earth and the church in heaven, we realize how much your holiness reminds us of our shortcomings and our sins. We confess before you, Holy Father, that we have sinned by not doing the right we should have done and by doing the wrong we shouldn't have. And we pray your forgiveness because we know that in Jesus Christ you are the Father who forgives us. Not because of any merits on our behalf but because of his sacrifice on the cross for which we will always remain grateful. And we pray, Lord, that the image of Christ might become ever more clear in us that the fruits of his spirit might show to those around us in this church and in the world in which you've set us. We thank you for your gracious love, for your forgiveness, for your restoration, and for the fact that you never tire of offering us a new chance and a new departure. Lord, as we come before you, we also want to fulfill our priestly office of bringing the world before you. We pray, Lord, in these troubled times for all those who suffer from COVID-19. We pray for those in the hospitals and clinics all around the world who are fighting the disease and alleviating the pain of those who suffer. Lord, be with them. We pray, Lord, for those who are in places of authority. We pray that they might bow their knees before you who are the President of Presidents, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We pray for wisdom for our own government in Luxembourg and for the Grand Ducal family. We pray for wisdom for so many countries that are in turmoil right now. We think of Peru, we think of the Philippines. We also think, Lord, of the United States of America. We think of Syria. We think of Northern Korea. We think of Yemen. And we pray, Lord, have mercy upon us. We pray, Lord, on this resurrection day, when your church gathered all, gathers all over the world, that your word might go out in power and that your Holy Spirit would apply it to your people so as to renew us, to restore unto us the joy of our salvation and to further us in the service of your kingdom. This we pray through grace, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thoughts and anxious fears. 
us in the fountain of your mercy. Come with your light, we cannot hide from you. Oh, mighty God, to you our hearts are open with gratitude. We raise our songs to you. Come and feel the praises of your people. In grace and truth, you make us you again. Scripture reading today is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized slave, free, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be his holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as member of one body, you were called to live in peace. And always be thankful. I want to thank Martin for bringing the message last week so I could have a staycation. Um, it was nice to have a little time off, but it's great to be back, and, and as you, hopefully you remember, uh, this autumn and winter, we are looking at um, key phrases, ideas, concepts, realities from the scriptures uh, that tell us who we are and help us know how to live. They help us understand what is happening. They, by embracing them and then expressing them, our lives are transformed and changed to be like God desires. 
Those words are love, grace, hope, peace, and faith. And those aren't the only ones, but they're the ones that we're going to take time to look at. And wherever there is dissonance or a break between what we say we believe and how we actually live, it's almost always a lack of either understanding of these or that we don't personally embrace the reality of them. So we can just not make sense to us or we can know what they mean, but we do not put them into practice. Our outward expression to others in reality is reflected in what we believe. The inward habits and realities of our life, the way we live. Let me give you an example of this. You may notice that um, professional athletes um, do a lot of the same things all the time. So if you're a football player, and forgive me Americans, but I meant European football, um, the kind that you actually use a foot for most of the time, you, do, you dribble and pass, you would work on your footwork, you sprint, goal placement and penalty shots, and you do it over and over and over again. I can't, remember, I can't tell you how many times I've watched uh, a news program and in the background those guys are doing the same thing that they did in the last one I saw, again and again and again. You think, don't, they're professionals, don't they know how to do this? And the answer is, yeah, but if they don't do them, they lose the skill. If you're a professional basketball pra- pra- player, you, learned, you dribble again and again, you pass, learn to pass, you shoot, you do foul shots, you sprint, you move without the ball, you put your hands up on defense, all these things you do over and over and over again. And why is that? So that what you do on the outside is a reflection on what you know and have learned on the inside. You have to practice it. Not just know it, but you have to practice it, especially to be at that high level. Oftentimes, the reality in our life is we don't need to know more. Now, I'm not saying don't know more, okay? Because we do need to learn more. But we don't really need to know a lot more to live our faith. We just need to do the things that we know. And so as we talk about love last month and grace this month, it's really about us doing more with what we know or understanding more what is this grace that God has given to us. What is it that we're really called to live in and practicing it so that it becomes a normal, natural part of our lives and not an unnatural part of our lives that we talk about we don't actually do. So today we're going to turn to expressing grace to one another. But it's just like sports, that if you're not performing that very well, if you're not doing a very good job of of what we share today from the Scriptures, then the key is not to go off and learn something different. The key is not to blame the people around you. Those are the two that we often do. The key is to go, what is it about grace that I don't understand? Because that's almost always the problem. We know the concept. We could teach about the reality. But we're not living in God's grace ourselves. And we can't share more than what we have. Not really. Not for long. And not in a meaningful way. And so it should always turn us back and say, what does it mean for me to live under God's grace that is given to you and to me in Jesus Christ so that I can express it to one another, to the other people in my life in the church. And so don't move beyond that. Don't don't try to go off and find the answer in something different. Go back to grace. Go back and look and say, what does it mean for me to live in God's grace? You know, we never get past it. We never move on. We never say, oh, I got that. It's over. We always, always need to come back and experience again the grace of God and then express and live it to other people. And so in Colossians chapter 3, the apostle gives an image. And this image, if you look back in the first part of the passage, it has about taking things off. Taking off the, the old things from our old nature, our old life that aren't good anymore and putting something new on. Putting clothing yourself, it talks about. And uh, I'm going to give you an, an example today. You, you might be aghast if, if I told you that um, this is not true, so just don't worry, okay? If I told you that, you know, typically I, I wear a T-shirt for four weeks at a time, but I change my outside shirt, so it's okay. 
When I walk by, you'll go, woo, it's not okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's on the outside if what's underneath it is stinking, is dirty, is ugly, and needs to be at least washed. If not, well, in that case, probably thrown away. Now, I just want you to know, I'm not wearing a T-shirt, so it's okay, all right? So not to worry. Don't wear T-shirts all that much, but I do have one, obviously. And so I think what th I want us to see about this is that grace calls us to take off things. And that's in the first part of the passage, and it's really helpful to go and look at that because sometimes we, we don't even know the things we should take off, and we think these things are fine. And then we realize, no, they're not. They're not okay. They, they stink. They're from our old life. They don't have the aroma and the beauty and the presence of Christ. And, and we need to let go of them. They don't fit with our new life. They don't fit with our new identity of who we are. As God set apart and beloved people, that's who we are by grace, set apart for a purpose, chosen by him, and deeply and dearly loved. And the Holy Spirit then calls us to live as those people with one another in community. And so there are ways in which we are called to do this, which this passage really talks about. And, and the first way is that it reminds us that because we have God's grace on us now, we have a different nature. We have a different identity. We are a different person than we were before. And this, this difference is we are called now to be taught and to learn who our creator is. And then we are called to learn to become like him in who we are. So there's a movement to coming to God and then growing to be like God. And, and this passage then leads us into what does that look like for us to make that shift, to have that move in our life? What things do we need to put on ourselves to do that? It reminds us, too, that there are things that matter and things that don't really matter in life. There are things we paid attention to that don't matter. And there are things that we pay maybe not pay attention to that really do matter. And what doesn't matter is this. What doesn't matter is our differences. And yet, isn't it interesting? That's oftentimes the thing that we think really matters. It's actually the thing that we notice, isn't it? Is the differences. Male, female, hairstyles, what you're wearing. It's the thing that set us, sets off our differences and we are honed in to, to look and to see those differences in each other. But what this passage is telling us is those things don't really matter in our new identity. It doesn't matter what our religious heritage is, where we came from religiously. It doesn't matter what our culture is. And we have a lot of different cultures in this room, a lot of different cultures that are watching today. That's not what really matters. It doesn't matter our social status, doesn't matter what job title we have, skin color, income bracket, education, how physically beautiful we are or how intellectually adept we are. Those are not the things that matter, but they are the things that we pay attention to. And they were the things that they paid attention to. And Paul is helping them see in your new identity in this place of grace those things in comparison don't really matter. It's not that they're bad. Your culture isn't necessarily bad at all. But it's not what really matters. What really matters is Christ. It talks about Christ as the one who is the exalted one, the one through whom everything finds its purpose and place in chapter 1. And what really matters is that you're in Christ. Your differences don't matter that much. I mean, they're there, and it's kind of interesting and exciting. But that's not really the most important part about who you and I are, who we are as a community. What's most important is Christ, that we are in Christ. And that that's where our life is found. And that's what we have in common. And that's a billion times more important than all of our differences. And when we believe that, and act on that, we see people differently. And difference is just what's well, just different. 
I had a saying that I don't think I say very much, but I used to get caught in the church I was at before. A good friend of mine would always say, Paul, you, you know, you, you say a lot. That's okay, you know. And it was good for Dave because Dave sometimes got frustrated by the differences, and I'd go, that's okay. It was just a reflex for me. I don't know if I even believed it, you know, because sometimes we say stuff we don't believe. I, I think I did in many ways. But, you know, our differences, for the most part, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's not what really matters. And yet if we put our focus on that, we make it matter. Instead of our focus being on Christ. Now let's be honest that we do notice the things around other people and it does affect us. It does influence how we treat them. But you know what? When we notice it and we focus on it, it's the old dirty t-shirt. We've got to take it off. It's just an acknowledgement when we see those things and we start to get frustrated about that or angry about that or indignant or judgmental. It's a reminder we're wearing the old T-shirt that we need to throw away because it doesn't fit us. It's not who we are anymore. And so whenever and wherever we see prejudice, we know that we've lost sight of what really matters, and that's Christ. So let me ask you a question. What kind of people do you look down upon? You might be offended that I asked you such a thing. And yet, my guess is there are people that you would say, I'd never do that. I'd never wear that. I wouldn't say that. I might think it, but I wouldn't say it. Right? See, that's us seeing the difference. And in some way, shape, or form, it may just be a small looking down, but it's a, it's a looking down on other people. We are really challenged not to just notice the difference, but then to judge the difference as somehow significant, as somehow it's an affront to us that they're different. And so often these differences do not really matter, but we make them matter. And what it reminds us is that we have space to grow. You know, what I would really encourage you to do in the next few weeks, this week, is to kind of do what is called non-judgmental observation of yourself. Watch the things that you think about. Watch the times when you say, I can't believe that. Watch yourself, but non-judgmentally. Because when you watch yourself and we judge ourselves, then we defend ourselves. And that's bad. (laughs) We don't want to defend ourselves. We don't need to defend ourselves. We're in grace. We're forgiven. God knows what he got into. He knows what he's working on. He knows the grace is enough, but it takes time to seep into our souls. That we need to practice because we're not very good at living in grace. And so non-judgmental observation allows us to see what's there and just acknowledge it. And say, Lord, give me the grace to see the difference, but not worry about it. Yea, not even judge it. And from time to time, Lord, may I have the grace to celebrate it. Maybe because I don't have it, but they do. See, that's the transformation power of grace, but it has to be practiced. Just preaching it and hearing it or reading it doesn't do it. Any more than buying a football, taking it out of the package and kicking it around the backyard doesn't make you a professional football player. You've got to practice. And life gives you daily opportunities, gives me daily opportunities to practice these things. So in chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, it gives us five vices that he, Paul is calling people to take off. He says, this is the dirty T-shirt that you need to take off. And then he has... Five plus two, well, we're going to talk about two. There's actually three in there, virtues to put on instead of that. To be those who are recipients of grace, those who are called by God, those who are set apart by God, and those who are beloved by God. This is what you're to to wear. This is the clothes you're supposed to put on. You've taken off the old stuff, great. That's a start. Now put on the new things that you need. And you may notice, if you've been doing four today, that many of these things were mentioned in our passage of reflection last week from Galatians chapter 5. 
And the reason is because these things are produced by the Holy Spirit, which reminds us that we cannot produce these things on our own in any length of time, with any depth, on our own. It comes through the Holy Spirit at work in our life as we yield to him. And so you might read this list and kind of go, I'm really going to try and do that this week. And I, I think that's a good thing, but I would say, I really, Holy Spirit, help me to yield to you and to do this. And to know that I'll stumble and fall because I'm not professional yet, not even close. But I want to grow in my skill of living in God's grace and expressing God's grace to others. So I'm going to go through these quickly. I could spend a sermon on each one of these if at least we spent, one of them is love, and we spent um, a month on that. So forgive me if it's just touching on it, but this is to give you a starting place. The first is to have that we are called to have with one another, to express towards one another, tender-hearted mercy. And from the core of who we are as a new person in Christ, we need to look at need and failure differently. Because when we see need and failure, what happens? We have a choice. We have a division. We have a, a direction we can go. We can either judge and say, I can't believe that. That's terrible. Or we can have compassion. That's, that's the fork in the road. And that's a choice. And grace leads us to having tenderhearted from the heart, real genuine compassion for the situation of that person. That may not be my sins or my areas of struggle, but it's theirs, and I've got mine. And because I'm aware of that, I can have compassion on that person in the community of faith who isn't yet growing up in that area. I have my heirs, they have their heirs, but having tender-hearted compassion. Do you know Jesus had compassion for people because he saw that they were sheep without a shepherd? And so in their messy need, he saw their real need to be led. And he came and he did that. See, he could have judged. But John 3 tells us he didn't come to judge. He came to reveal God and he came to lead people because they needed to be led. And that's what he did. He had compassion. And compassion takes you down a different road than judgment. And yet we all have the capacity to judge. The second is kindness or generosity towards one another, towards others in the community. And this kindness isn't because they're kind to us. Now, that's the way we like to do it, right? If you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. And if you're not nice to me, then I'm not, I don't, phew, you don't deserve niceness from me. But see, that's not our new nature. That's not this new identity that we have. Whether you're nice to me or not, I am here to be nice to you to show kindness to you because I have been shown kindness through Jesus Christ. And at times means we have to look beyond the brokenness of our brother or sister in Christ. Their unfinishedness, their messiness. You know, kindness brings a lot more transfer to transformation than judgment. It just does. So if we really want to see them change, which we tell ourselves we do, then we would move away from judgment and move towards kindness. And that might include being honest. But to be kind as we're honest, to be generous, to give more, not less. The third thing this list talks about in terms of what we were to put on uh, as we think about our garment is to have humility. And humility is a state of mind that affects our actions. It's an awareness of all that I don't know and all that I don't do. Even if you do more than others, guess what? You don't do everything. Even if you know more than other people, you don't know everything. It's humility. We are far more wrong than we are right. More often than not, we're wrong in what we think and what we say. But we don't think that because that's not the way we keep score. We keep score on the things we do right. On the things we do wrong, well, we forget that. <laughs> we don't add that up. 
But humility allows us to step back and say, you know, I, I'm just really in process here. I understand some things, but my brothers and sisters, they understand some things. And I need something from them, and they need something from me. And, and together we can do something beautiful, but alone, it's not really all that much that I bring. Humility allows us to work together. A humble person can be led. A proud person cannot or will not be led. That's just the reality. And when we are proud, it reminds us that we have forgotten grace. Because we didn't get in Christ through our efforts. It was the mercy of God that came to us and that brought us into this relationship with Jesus Christ. The fourth thing is to be gentle, to have gentleness towards one another. You know, people are incredibly strong in many ways. It's, it's amazing what people can resist, but we all have cracks and we all have fault lines and places where if you just touch us, we fall apart. Our heart breaks. And you know, the reality of what we just talked about with humility, we don't know where that is for each other. So you might think this person is incredibly strong and then you touch that place and they fall apart. And that's why we have to be gentle because we're broken people with cracks and flaws and hurts. And it's easy in our frustration, our anger to be harsh and mean. But that's, yep, the dirty t-shirt. That's the past. Our identity now is to be people who express the gentleness of God. You think about many times when Jesus dealt with broken people, how gentle he was. How kind and giving and forgiving. The fifth thing we're called to put on in this garment is patience or long-suffering. And again, have you noticed how many of these are fruit of the Spirit? Fruit singular, one. Reflections of the Spirit in our life. That we're called to be patient with one another. Because oftentimes people will do things that exasperate us. That are not good. That drive us crazy. And you know, during this time of the pandemic probably a lot of us feel like our patience is at the edge. And it is. But you know what? There's a whole nother storeroom of patience that you and I have that maybe we're not tapping into. Because when we rest in the Spirit of God, He produces patience in our life. We are actually able to step back and look and say, God's in charge. I'm not. I wouldn't do it this way, but I'm not God. And I can trust God in the midst of this. And I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds that future and the present and my life and those I love. And so, Lord, I can be patient. You know, the best time to realize you need to be patient when you realize you're impatient. And remember when that happens, non-judgmental self-observation helps so you can take a step back and say you know that's my old self and I want to live into my new self without condemning yourself because you're not very good at this yet just like I'm not very good at this yet the fifth thing that the, the things to two to add on to this that these five here are our love and the reality is in community we are going to have the or I'm sorry forgiveness the reality is in community we're going to have the need to forgive I'm going to offend you if we hang out together, you're going to offend me. <laughs> and that means forgiveness needs to be in our community. And forgiveness means to let go of retaliation, let go of paying you back. You know, which means, as I've said before many times, means we pay twice when you forgive, and that's why we find it so hard to do. But we are called to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us because the Lord has forgiven us. So we're called to put on the spirit of forgiveness, to be ready to forgive one another, knowing that the offense will come, not being surprised when people do things that they shouldn't or when we do things we shouldn't. And it's such a wonderful thing to be in a community where you can give and receive forgiveness, where you can express your sin and know that instead of judgment, what comes to you is what you need. 
and what God has given you already, which is forgiveness. And you know, that's the kind of community that creates something beautiful, something life-changing, something that people want to be a part of. And the last one, just to mention briefly, but we talked about it for a month, is to love is to put on love. And love is this, this thing that pulls you all together. It's almost like once you put a nice outfit on, okay, and then now you ladies do this. I, I wouldn't do this. I mean, guys, if you want to, feel free. But you get that beautiful scarf out, and you drape it around, and when people see you, you know what they go, what a beautiful scarf. They don't go, what, what, what nice shoes. What a great watch. No. They, they see that beautiful scarf. See, love is that thing that you put around that really reflects the beauty of the whole. That people see love. That's the idea of this passage. And so it's that, that thing that we put on at the end, but that which people see that is reflected on us. This is how we are called to live together in community. And I don't know about you, but my ego says, no. I mean, I want this for me, but I don't know if I want to do this for you. That's a lot of work. I'm not very good at that. And God says, but this is who you are now, Paul. This is your new way of living. Practice it. Mess up. Get better. Learn from others who know more how to do that than you do. But this is the way that we are called to live together in community. And this kind of community is one that invites other people. Not because we speak about it, although we should, but because they see a place of grace and they say, I want to know what's going on in there. I don't know if I want their Jesus, but I want that life. I want to be with those people. You know why they say that? Because what they really want is God. They just think God is completely different, angry, judgmental. They don't think God is tender-hearted or kind or gentle or patience or forgiving or loving. And so they are to see that through us. But for that to happen, we have to make that choice to live in this new identity, to take off the old and to put on this new set of clothing and to live that towards one another. And to practice in here so that we're better out there. Do you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we come to you as people who are very uncoordinated in this new life. In fact, some people might look at us and go, that's hopeless. They'll never get that together. And yet, that's not your view of us. You have put us in Christ. You have led us to live with grace around us and grace within us and the hot power of the Holy Spirit to drive us in this direction to make mistakes, to learn. So Lord, help us practice these things. And Father, if we have a difference with these, if we disagree with these, may you be the one who teaches so that we can be the community that you deserve and that reflects you. May this be true for us. May this be true for each church in Luxembourg and for churches across the world. May we not be angry. May we not be demanding our rights. But may we be seeking to live this way. Because then people will want to know Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand up and respond to what we have just heard with the song, Take My Life.
this precious stone. Take my sin and I will be ever only all for thee. Take our lives. Let us be. As you go, go knowing that you are surrounded by the grace of God and that within you also is that same grace. Christ Jesus lives in you and in your brother and sister. Love Christ in them. Live with Christ in you, in his grace. And go knowing the love of God the Father, which is all over you. Go knowing the peace of Christ and go knowing the power of the Holy Spirit to live this way towards each other. Go practice, fail, and succeed. Amen. Thanks so much for being here. We hope you guys have a great, great week. God bless.
won't be long And we will behold Him And every tear He'll wipe away And we'll be at home Jesus Christ, the King above all kings.